All right, last segment here. Let's bring this one home. This came from uh, from Joshua Benning, somebody who's been really active in getting connected with us, asking us questions. So yeah, should restaurant operators sign contracts or freelance their ordering? He's got Lucia Cantina out in Rockford, Illinois. And he sent us a note. And I actually asked him, I was like, do you want me to PC this at all when I read it? He's like, no, read what I said. This is my reality that I'm living. It's like respect. So here's what Joshua had to say. Since the pandemic, out of stocks are still an issue with the major food houses. I unfortunately have a contract with U.S. Foods that says the majority of my purchases need to come through them. Fortunately, they aren't enforcing the terms. They have tons of OOS out of stock, which means I need to get products from Cisco or PFG, but can't get a truck to stop for two cases. I often need 20 cases. Now I find myself price shopping three houses. This is a win for me, but not for U.S. Foods, who gave me a fat check before the pandemic to be primary. So again, should operators sign contracts or freelance their ordering? Sean, I know you had some emotions and thoughts about this. Oh, Give them boy. to us. Well, I'm happy. I mean, this, this is why we do the show, Josh. I, I love that guy. He's runs an incredible restaurant and he's been a, a friend to me, but um, we are, our primary food partner is us foods. And I talk about primary partnerships a lot. I mean, I, I, when I opened up the restaurant, I didn't know anything about how to run a restaurant. I, I signed up for restaurantowner.com, And one of the things that they kept talking about was a primary food vendor partnership. How do you get a primary food vendor partnership? So you're not shopping on a weekly basis and getting Cisco to come in and tell you the prices are low one week and then having U.S. foods come and say they'll beat those foods and then having Shamrock come and PNG and whatever, whoever else it is, and then going to Restaurant Depot or Costco or wherever you go all this all this time. I mean, I literally my wife and I, Rosie, we went to the a Greek restaurant that we love in our community close to our restaurant. And the guy was complaining about chicken prices. And I'm like, well, who's your primary food vendor? And he goes, I don't have one. I use five different vendors and I'm going around shopping. And my wife was like, that's crazy. Like, that's crazy. I remember back in the day when we used to go out shopping for things that we buy, like brisket, you know, all the stuff that we buy. So, you know, what Josh brings up is a very sensitive topic because we sign these agreements for U.S. foods to make sure that they stock these things. But then the pandemic hits. So then what happens? I mean, I think to Josh's point, which now that it's here on the RIF stage is start to have conversations with U.S. foods, start to have conversations with their sales rep, their district rep, and go through LinkedIn and find out who do I need to talk to at U.S. foods? Because that's what I've done. Yeah. Our primary technology partners, they're sitting right here. This is Zach Oates. Welcome to, welcome to Ovation. Like it doesn't get any more personal than this. And Zach knows from us working together and my team working together, I'm not going to bother him and waste his time. But if there's something that goes wrong on Ovation's end, which hasn't gone wrong, but if there's something we think we can be improved, I'm going to be vocal. I'm going to go down the proper channel to give a feedback company feedback. Yeah. And guess what? He makes the product better for everybody else. So to Josh and to any other restaurant owner, myself included, I'll talk to my contacts at U.S. Food and say, what's happening? Because guess what? The Internet's anywhere. Anyone that's listening to this show, no matter what, who you do business with, I guarantee you they don't want to fail. They want to be better. That is why companies like Toast have a customer advisory board where I sit in there and they have restaurant owners from all over that come and they complain about things that they don't like about Toast. It's a therapy guess what? question. It's well, it, it, it kind of is, but that's how you make things better. We're not mm. perfect. Like no one has a perfect business. I don't care how big you are, how small you are. We're all trying to figure this thing out in 2023. I wonder about dynamic pricing in this game, right? Because there's so many things where our prices go up from food vendors. I remember when, when gas fees were a thing. And we're like, okay, gas prices went up. And so it makes sense. But then those gas fees never left. I'm like, so is this just the new modality? Because what you told us was this was a short-term thing because of a rise in cost. And so they keep... way, thank you for not saying new norm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> can't say pivot? Did we pivot? Yeah. New norm. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. God. Everyone's new favorite word in the pandemic is pivot. But dynamic pricing makes sense that there are fluctuations. So how do we anticipate those fluctuations? How can I get ahead of them is something I'm very interested in as well. If I'm better at menu planning, do I get better pricing because I'm locking in the asparagus before anybody else, whatever that might be. So I, I think there's something to be said about 
about that a, a, approach and think about that. Kyle, for you, w- what was your approach? Did you have the single vendor? Were you shopping around? What was your what was your approach there? Yeah, you know, in the beginning, it was very much like what Sean is saying. You know that hey, we'll buy this from you, but if we're out, we're going to go over here and get approached by the, the independent meat guy, and then the other, you know, the pizza specialist guy, and all this stuff. But you know, as we started to grow, it was like, all right, let's make this easier. And things started coming online. Then we joined like this buying group that helps consolidate our pricing. But to me, it always came down to the conversation. Like if you, one of the best things we ever did was say, hey, you know, we we made like meatballs, for example. Like hey, we bought I don't even remember what it was, a thousand pounds of ground beef last year. You know, on average, you charged us X. If we agree to buy a thousand and eleven hundred pounds this year, can you give us this price and lock it in? Just but have the conversation. I think like my partner was awful at. He had this like contentious feeling, like these fucking guys. They, they'll, 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 <laughs> you know, like real New York. I know, right? Like find, like have the conversation because that guy who, who you're talking to, you know, we meet face to face. Like, hey, you shorted me three times last month. I don't know if we can continue to do this. You know, we put us in a tough spot. He's not going to want that to get back to his boss because he's going to be out on his ass, right? But I think another thing that came from this pandemic, other side, other than the, the landlord stuff and the employee stuff, is if you had, I mean, how many how many restaurants were caught in a lurch when it was like, oh shit, we don't have the money to pay that bill that's due, but now we need a delivery because now we're open for delivery. We haven't had the sales because we don't have the cash. Well, if you had a relationship. Like you could have dealt with it. Right. If you were behind yeah. six months on your bills, it was a little bit of a different story, right? So I think yeah. you have to have the conversation and somebody will make it happen. It might not be who you think right away, but yeah, like it's, I think it's becoming easier because they're all starting to realize that, especially with online ordering and pricing availability. You're, you're building that, that bench on the other side now too, Kyle, huh? On the vendor side. You're well, building no, that it's, it's a feedback. Kyle's loop. always building that. Oh, don't bench. make me call the other guy. I'll get that, my asparagus from the farm Tommy. system. It's, interesting because i think there's also different ways to look at it they might come at you and say here's the contract that we want to put in front of you what i used to do is not sign that contract i would say i want to negotiate 20 items with you and i would lock in 20 items what was interesting is everybody goes after the items with the thinnest margin even on the on the vendor producer distributor side because they're the highest ticket items i was always interested in net net so we had like the best possible deal on paper towels and straws because at the end of the year over a given period we spent a lot of money on those items and i could get that locked in at eight and a half percent but if i'm trying to just negotiate my my ribeye well i can only get that down to 13 percent so that we look at the shiny stuff too often and i think it's important to look at the net net of what you're trying to do and have that bottom line be better because you do have more negotiating power on certain products especially on non perishable items so i would think about it that way as well we get scared of the ground beef prices we get scared of the chicken prices completely understandable we need to manage that but look at the totality of the business that you're trying to manage right and it's the unsexy stuff that usually will yield the best results so joshua maybe that helps you lock in pricing as a SaaS company zach oh Hmm. do we like I will say we have God, never God's raised wheeling and dealing on the show. This is fucking so 20, great. <laughs> we started in 2016. We have not raised prices once for any customer. No, but for your vendor partners. Oh, for our vendor partners. Uh, we, so, I mean, we, our, our costs are a lot less variable. Yeah. Right. Sure. Like I buy text messages and the text messages are, because our whole system is based on SMS and it's very expensive for us, but it's the right thing for the guest, right? So we might not have as much margin as someone who does email marketing, but our guests are getting 20 times more benefit than if we did mm. uh, than if we did like email surveys, right? And email communication back and forth. So we once we get to a certain volume, then we can get down to a certain price. But our, our price are all locked in, um, at least for the duration of the contract. Heard. So you do sign contracts. Yeah. Oh. Do you, what okay. what is do you have do you have a limit on your contract? Sean, you're right. going to have to negotiate this after the hey, show. <laughs> well, no. Sorry. Ovation, we yeah. sign contracts that's, for that's what our I'm vendors. About. That's yeah. what I'm talking about. Right. Yeah. Is like yeah. did somebody say like, "Hey, Zach, will you sign a 3-year contract? Do you do 3-year contracts?" Or you go, "No, I only do a year contract." Uh, I'll do I've done uh 2. 2-year two contracts is the biggest I've done. Got it. 
All right, Sean wants a three-year contract. He wants to be the first to get a three-year contract. He wants a lifetime contract. 